Hello, my friends. Pastor Rick Soto here, and I am on the Ranch Church property, which the Lord Jesus Christ has given unto us. And it is a beautiful morning here. I hope you can join us here sometime live and in person. So glad to be coming to your home uh, or wherever you find yourself at at this very moment. It is not an accident that we are with each other right now. So stay tuned. We've got some great things as we talk about the scriptures, as we worship the Lord together. And so I'm going to pray and ask that the cares of this world grow so strangely dim before you. And I know that in these very next few moments, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to bless you. And so I love you so much, and I'm glad to be together. And just on a side note right now, because it might actually come into view, I have a bunch of horses that are actually running around me. So don't let that bother you if you actually see see some of these guys coming into view. Uh, but let's worship the Lord right now and turn our hearts towards home. Lord Jesus, I pray, and I pray, God, that we would meet with you and know you as never before. That would be truly of your divine pleasure to fall afresh on us this day. God, we need you so desperately. We truly do. And so I pray that you would come with great power and be sufficient for that meeting. I pray blessing on my friends now in Jesus' name. Say it with me. Amen. Amen. Let's worship. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you lord all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only great are you lord you bring life you are love you bring life to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you lord great are you It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. You bring light. You are love. You give light to the darkness. You bring hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. are you Lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our 
praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Pouring out our praise, pouring out our worship, all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing, great are you Lord, all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord oh the earth oh the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only, O oh Lord. Great are you, Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great are you, Lord. Great are you. For you are good to me, for 
you are good. Yes, you are good. For you are good to me. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. To in all of your ways You're perfect in all of your ways to us You are You are so good So, so good you are so good to me, yes you are, yes you are, yes you are. Go in your Bibles, my friends, to Romans chapter 6 and follow along with me as we're talking about how to die to the flesh, how to actually die to the flesh. Really fascinating concept that the Apostle Paul is going to give us. He continues on his thoughts from the end of Romans chapter 5 into Romans chapter 6. And we'll just see how we do here as we look at these amazing verses and teachings from the scriptures here which uh, first started out here at the very end of Romans chapter 5. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is wonderfully true. For what Paul is saying here, again, I'm referencing the very end of Romans chapter 5, is this unbelievable, but believe it truth, that if your sin were to actually increase in the thermometer of God, in the meter of God, God's grace will be greater than your sin. And I know this personally, my friends. I am not talking to you about a dry theology. This, this section here is what changed my life, these verses. Uh, These were things that were given to me uh, through Bible study, the very, very beginning of my Christian life that had uh, dynamic power that came in to me. The first one was a guy by the name of Dr. Bill Bright, who you got to love somebody who's writing Bible materials if his name's Bright. And so he had a series of teachings on this. And then years later, I'd I'd, I'd have another kind of born-again experience when I listened to Pastor Chuck Smith teach on this section of the scriptures, and it was phenomenal. And so we're talking about how to die, how to die to the flesh. Into Romans chapter 6 now, read with me. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Remember, that's a logical thought. Okay, well, if I can, if I can just sin and sin and sin, who cares? May it never be. Even though that grace will abound, God's going to change our hearts very dramatically. I we continue in sin that grace may abound by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? I'll explain more of that in a moment. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. I'd like to encourage you to memorize that. And uh, uh, write, write this verse down and put it on, on your refrigerator or put it on a digital device of some sort that it might marinate inside you. So in the original language of uh, may it never be, or by no means, it depends on your translation. In the original language of the Bible in Greek, it's actually a very fascinating word. And it's one I think you're going to love. It's called mega noito. 
And so Mega Noito is what you might think Mega, which is really large, extremely large, very big. And Noito is really uh, very cousin to our English word no. And so it's really big no. <laughs> Should we continue on in sin because God's grace is greater than our sin? Very big no. And so there's this deliverance that can come over us related uh, to the flesh. Now, uh, one time, uh, years ago, I was with my former pastor, my pastor actually, he's not my former pastor, my pastor, excuse me, Pastor Ricky Ryan. And Ricky was preaching. And in the audience was this wonderful elderly couple, older couple. And, um, you know, most people, kind of the Calvary Chapel movement came out of sort of a hippie revival uh, days. And so most people dress rather casual. This was a very uh, classy and uh, good-looking uh, older couple. And so Ricky was preaching on the flesh, and he kept saying uh, with every bullet point, he'd have a bullet point, and he'd say, so say no to the old man. And that was a way of talking about the flesh. The flesh is the old man, the old nature, as the scripture describes. And so he would say, okay, well, you've got this problem, say no to the old man. And then he'd say, second point, he'd say, say no to the old man. He had a whole series of points where he saying, say no to the old man. So that couple married, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 years, something like that. They get along great. They're awesome people. The wife began to kind of pull one over on the husband where uh, she began to say no to him that night and the following days over all kinds of things. To where he finally stopped. He said, listen, honey, we've been married so long. You're just the greatest. But what is up with you? Since we went to church this last week, you have been saying no to me. So what is going on with you? And she looked at him. You got to know this gal because she's witty. She's really witty. She says, well, I went to church with you. I read the Bible. I studied the Bible with pastor, listened to the preaching. And he said that I have to say no to the old man. <laughs> so I'm saying no to you. Oh, my goodness. So that's not exactly the kind of old man that the Bible is talking about. And the scripture says here these things about this newness of life. The scripture is talking about Nicodemus, where Jesus in John chapter 3 was talking to Nicodemus about being born again. Nicodemus is this wonderful rabbi and has some real theological muscle, and he wants to know how does salvation work. And he says, well, everyone, Jesus is teaching, he says, everyone who comes in this world physically but not everyone is born spiritually. Nicodemus wants to know about this. He's musing about this. And Jesus tells him, you must be born again. They're talking to a Jewish rabbi. And so these are the, the theological thoughts of that kind of teaching. Do you know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death, is a way of understanding that this transfer has actually taken place. And so I'm dead. I'm now dead to sin. And I can begin, as we'll look at a few moments, to reckon myself as dead to sin. And I can begin to take on this new identity in Christ. And so if Jesus Christ, now listen, you have to follow this. If he went into the grave, and if we are identified with him, then we go into the grave. And then if we are identified with him as we went into the grave, then that same third day resurrection power and that new life, that is Jesus Christ's life, we are attached now to that new life in him. And so we go on this journey to reckon those things dead. And we work through all things related to the flesh. For here is, here is Paul's logic. Now, I'll continue on in the chapter in verse 5, speaking in Romans 6. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. That's the point. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves 
dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. A great, great section of theology. My goodness, that is so wonderful. And so let's chat about this and teach and preach about this a couple different ways. First, you have to understand that the flesh is strong. And so the strength of the flesh is that it wants to take normal desires and make idols out of them. So, for example, in terms of uh, anatomy, we have, we have a normal desire to drink water. And we have a normal desire physically to have food. And yet people make idols out of them. And they have all kinds of paranoias over their bodies and over eating and consumption. Too high or too low or quality, whatever it is. But they make idols out of that. Uh, we have biological need for exercise and fitness, uh, but people make idols out of that. They make those things the most ultimate. Uh, we, have, we have real biological needs actually for fun and for laughter. And go have fun and go have laughter. This would be, this would be great. These would be good things for you. But people make idols out of them. And so when we make idols out of things that are normal and things that are, are, are spe- supposed to be a part of our lives, but when we make them the ultimate, the flesh rises up and tries to grab us and beat us and pull us into guilt and pull us into shame and, and tries to quench the fire of the Holy Spirit from us and begins to alter our personalities against Christ and sometimes even against one another. And so that is the flesh. And it must be considered, as the scripture was saying here, or reckoned or thought of as it's dead. That is part of how we begin to understand spiritual victory. And so we want to be careful with this. Years ago, I was in training to be a lifeguard. Don't judge me, years ago. And, and so as part of the lifeguard training, much to my surprise, if someone was in the water and they were, they were being victimized, little did I know that my training was to not go and immediately rescue them. So I'd approach a victim, and, and I, I mess this up every time. My instructors were really laughing at me and hard on me. And so if you grab somebody in the water who's being victimized, they can actually take you down with them. They're actually capable of their, in their adrenaline rush and of their paranoia, of their absolute panicking for life, of grabbing you, even as a trained lifeguard, even with greater fitness than they have, and actually drowning you. And so double drownings is what it's called. And water safety instruction is actually a really big deal, very important concept to, to understand how to work through. And so one training exercise uh, I'm approaching this lifeguard who's now going to play the victim and he's going to take me down. He's a former water polo player, all of 6'8 or something like that. And he's huge and he looks great and he has me by about 100 pounds, it seems like. Uh, and so, so anyway, he takes me down to the bottom of the pool. And then on top of that, they're also going to put a, a weight on your ankle. And so they're going to try and train you to get used to that panic. So I go to the bottom of the pool with the instructor. The weight is put on my ankle. And then I've got to shake myself loose. It's just really not that difficult. It's a training exercise. And then we make it to the top. The, the, the point is, that's what the flesh can be like. The flesh is something that actually wants to grab you. And it can deceive you. It deceives you through idolatry. And then it will actually take you right down. And what most people do is wallow at that moment. They say to themselves, I'm, I'm a Christian. I go to the ranch church. I listen online. Uh, I've already repented. I've been baptized. I've, I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. How is it possible? How is it possible that the flesh got me again? And so Jesus comes so beautifully to remind us and to tell us That we are dead to sin. And because we are dead with sin, we are now identified with the death of Jesus Christ. And because we're identified with the death of Jesus Christ, we have newness of life. 
I mean, because we have newness of life, we have the grace that will be greater than that sinful moment, that will be greater than that sinful season, that will be greater than that depressive episode. We have grace. The flesh is strong, but grace is actually stronger. And so the scripture continues on and says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you're not under law, but under grace. Okay, this is where we have to stop. Did you hear that? We're not under law, but we're under grace. So wherever you're at right now, wherever you're at, you're going to say this. You're going to say this. Say amen. Amen. You got to shout that. That's just great news. So grace is manifested in our life in the following way. And I must tell you quite candidly that all of us who are maturing in Jesus still nonetheless have moments where we struggle to do exactly what I'm about to say. For grace is manifested powerfully, and maybe, maybe it can even be said most powerfully, when we cry out to God, and not just cry out to God, but when we tell God, I can't do it. That cry is a cry that moves the Father's heart quickly to pour out abundant waves of grace. And so I can't do it. I can't shake off the flesh myself, or I can't do it, God. I don't understand how to be responsible with life or to take next positive steps in life or to focus my life. I can't do it. And so I cry out to God and I ask for his help. And so sometimes to be maturing in Christ or to be around church life, we somehow think that we're greater than that, that we've surpassed such a moment. The great news is we have not, not at all, not in any way, shape, or form. In fact, just the opposite. That cry of the heart only grows sweeter and more tender and more real as we say to God, I need your help, I can't do it, and I absolutely cry out to you. And so right now, my friends, I believe some of you need to engage in that cry of your heart. This is the most basic of teaching, the most clear-cut way of understanding the gospel, that through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, His grace is greater than your greatest sin. And His grace is greater than your most negative moment in life. And that His grace is greater than anything that could ever come against Him or against you. And so I'm going to pray right now. And I'm going to ask some of you to cry out to God. Maybe you've never done this. Maybe you've done it before and it feels so foreign and I've tried that. It's just I can't do that anymore. No, we're never beyond it. In fact, to think that you're beyond it is to actually lose it, to never have it. It will cut to the core of your being and your heart and your soul. The Bible tells us that the Word of God is living and active and that it's capable of cutting down to the very bones and marrows and inner working and parts of our soul and spirit. The Word of God was present at creation and part of the power of the creative order. The Word of God is what we hear in order to be saved. The Word of God is actually Jesus as He came in John chapter 1 1. And the Word of God now is absolutely alive, grabbing your heart and inviting you even begging you to cry out to God for greater grace. And so pray with me, my friend, and watch the miracle work of God. 
Lord Jesus, I pray for my friends right now who would be listening to this. And I pray with all kinds of supernatural power, Lord, that you would come and hear the cry of their hearts and that they would cry out to you and that they would stay in that place. Lord Jesus, I cry out to you for help. I can't do it. Help me please right now. And so, God, with those identifying with that prayer, I pray your grace to be this great sufficiency for this newness of life. Be their God, be their Savior, and be their friend. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, my friends, if you have identified with that prayer, I want to pray with you, and I want to know about you, and I need your help. I want you to go to ranchchurch.com. Listen, I'm not selling anything. I'm just here to bless your life and give to your life and pour out to your life. And we are, we are praying to do this for countless many in a local community and everywhere else. And so go to ranchchurch.com. There's a landing page right there in the very front that you can contact us, contact me, and you can let us know who you are and how we can be praying for you. We can send you any kind of material, and we will be absolutely, absolutely faithful to pray for you. We literally have, um, I don't know, a couple hundred people uh, that pray faithfully. And so just know that that will be faithful to that. Secondly, I want to invite you to go to ranchchurch.com slash give. We are passionate about telling 10 million people about Jesus Christ in 10 years. And we are just going to be simple, humble people taking one step at a time. That's all. We're going to be just doing this. <laughs> we don't have any great, uh, grandiose ideas or strategy, but we are passionate that God will give us great power to accomplish that very, that very will. We, we, we need a revival. We need to know Jesus. We all need to, just as we preach today, to cry out our hearts to God and to watch our entire communities be saved locally and abroad. So go to ranchchurch.com slash give and uh, be a giver. We make no apology for that, whatever. Our, our, uh, your tithes and offerings make possible all of our day-to-day operations of our church and also make possible... Uh, many of the additional great works that we get to do um, as God gives us grace and mercy. And so thank you. Thank you so much for that. I love you, my friends. Go in peace. Serve Jesus. And I love you very, very much. But Jesus Christ does all the more. In Jesus' name, amen.